Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today it's time to talk about Falcon 9 Block 5. Now, it's been a week since the launch of the Bangabandu satellite, and, well, actually, we've learned a little more since then, since that launch. So, uh, just rewind, Block 5 is, of course, SpaceX's evolution towards their final version of the Falcon 9. And according to Elon Musk, it's actually the sixth version of the rocket, which lends a little more, well, leaves us with a little more mystery as to re regarding the actual versioning system. But we all know the previous version was full thrust Block 4. And the transition to Block 5, well, the most obvious thing are the black areas, right? It looks a lot like old NASA rockets, which would have you know, black and white areas with very straight lines so that you could track them more easily from the ground. But on the Falcon 9, those black areas are coated with a new type of thermal insulation or thermal protection system because, of course, these boosters are coming back at several times the speed of sound and they get hot. In fact, we've seen some of the videos where the grid fins literally look like they're catching fire. Now, you might ask, why only some areas? Why some areas and not the others? And well, the black painted areas are, they're not painted, but the black coated areas, they get the highest heat. And uh, for example, the bottom of the rocket, which is going, you know, first leading the charge down on descent. But then there's also a black line up the side that corresponds to the racetrack. This is a conduit that runs up the side of the rocket and it carries things like a cables or small-scale plumbing, right? Uh, it sticks out a little, and because it sticks out, it actually gets slightly different, slightly higher uh, aerodynamic forces. Anything where the curvature becomes tighter will tend to get more uh, heating because it moves the kind of plasma or the, you know, the, the compression zone closer to the surface. So it ends up getting more heat, therefore they give it more protection. Uh, there's other parts on the rocket you can see sticking out where they have these. But interestingly, many people notice that the interstage, that is the section between the first and the second stage, right at the very top of the rocket, that is all black. Now, that, many people would think, is the furthest from any potential heating. It's furthest from the engines, right? It's behind anything interesting. So why is that black? Well, if we go and take a look at this fantastic picture comparing the recovered booster from the Bulgaria Sat launch, which was an older Block 4, and the Bangabandu launch, then it's really, really obvious. You can see that large parts of the interstage have been charred and blackened. You can also see that those old aluminium grid fins have, in, have been pretty badly beat up. In fact, they are missing chunks in places there. It's not unreasonable to believe that a lot of those black marks come from paint that has been stripped off and perhaps aluminium, which has literally been, you know, has been vaporized and deposited further up. The boosters actually, when they come back after the first flight, they uh, go from being white to being kind of soot colored, you know, kind of, they've got a bit of blackening to them. And that's because these boosters are flying using uh, kerosene, right? R R RP1. And that contains a lot of carbon. So on the descent back in particular, they're descending through their own rocket flame and they fire that thing up. So any uh, unburned carbon will come up and will stick to the side of the rocket. Uh, so that's what changes the color. But anyway, yeah, these are uh, you know, this this comparison is really amazing. It's also, it's also easy to see that when these grid fins are working, what they're really doing is they're kind of angling themselves to the airflow. And as they take up certain positions, they may direct the airflow more into the interstage, leading to a hot spot. So I'm guessing that's why they decided the interstage needed the full-on modern heat, uh, heat treatment, heat protection system. So yeah, another important difference between these two images is the aluminium grid fins versus the titanium ones. Now, titanium grid fins were previously flying before this. Um, the, they replaced the aluminium ones because they had a tendency to melt. Now, it was possible to patch these things up, and there's a few examples that have been shown of where plates have been bolted in to reinforce the structure and provide, uh, you know, uh, the extra aerodynamics. 
The newer titanium ones are larger. They have these like teeth coming out, which I don't think is possible in the aluminium because they would pretty much melt due to the heating. Um, they aren't painted or anything either, so there's not as much maintenance required. But the whole point is that these things don't need the level of inspection and repair that the aluminium ones did. So this helps them towards their goal of being able to refly a booster within 24 hours. Now, granted 24 hours isn't going to happen in this case. For a start, it landed on a barge and it took several days to come back. And until uh, they figure out how to fly these home, they're not going to get a 24 hour turnaround for a barge landing. They might manage it from an RTLS return to launch site. And I won't be surprised if Elon has asked about fueling up a booster on a barge and flying it back to the Cape, but I don't think that they would be too happy with that prospect just yet. But uh, yeah, I mean, they, Elon in his press conference said that they will plan to fly a Falcon 9 Block 5 back to back inside 24 hours before the end of next year. Now, I'm not sure what what that's going to involve, like whether who would fly a payload under those circumstances, but it would certainly be an impressive feat given that they've managed to reduce the turnaround time to a couple of weeks in theory. And the other space shuttle would take months to refurbish, obviously. And this particular booster, well, this is the first one, so they're not going to refly anytime soon. They're going to take this back and they're going to go over it in great detail. They're going to check that all their changes to make it uh, reusable haven't affected its reliability. So they're probably going to take a bunch of things apart. In particular, the landing legs, those were supposed to roll, uh, fold back up, right? The original landing legs that were used prior to Block 5, those had a, a locking collet which basically couldn't get, you know, couldn't get folded back up easily. They would take the legs off. Well, guess what? They're taking the legs off this one for transport so that they can test it. Presumably at some point they're going to give the thumbs up and we will see these ones reflying, but we're going to see some other Block 5s flying prior to this. Their, SpaceX has quite a busy schedule, although there are also a number of Block 4s that are going to fly. For example, Monday we've got a, a Iridium and a, the, the Grace satellite going up. But SpaceX really needs to get flying those Block 5s because they are part of the commercial crew program and they are aiming to start flying people in space before the end of the year. Now NASA's requirement is that they have to have seven full flights of this model of booster before they will let people on this thing. Now they are considering the Block 5 to be a complete and separate evolution. Therefore this is why SpaceX is making a big deal about this. They are essentially freezing the design after a lot of experimenting and a lot of kind of vague versioning. This one is going to be their final version. Uh, it's unlikely that we're going to see any other Falcon 9 variants, unless of course the BFR takes a little longer. But they expect that they're going to get about 300 flights out of this before uh, the BFR even uh, is ready to fly. We've also seen a few news stories cultivating the concern over load and go. Now load and go is basically uh, SpaceX's fueling procedure where you would put astronauts in an unfueled rocket and then fuel the rocket up and launch. Now um, previously what tends to happen or what's been happening is the rocket gets fueled up and it's sitting on the pad and it just gets continuously topped up and then the astronauts go out and get on board. And uh, there's some people that think this is, you know, potentially a safer way to do it because that's what they've done regularly. And hey, SpaceX did have this problem with AMOS where their composite overwrap pressure vessel managed to trigger an explosion. And there's a lot of concern, but of course people have also done the Photoshop thing where they lay the video of the escape test, the escape system test over the explosion and they say, well, the astronauts probably would have got out alive. Having said that, I wouldn't necessarily want to test this. But yeah, I mean, you know, not gonna cultivate any conspiracy theories, but SpaceX are very concerned about this and they've worked very hard and Elon has went into the on the on and on in the press conference about their pressure vessels, about how these are the most advanced pressure vessels ever developed by humans. They've tested these ways 17 ways to Sunday, right? I mean, 
You know, he really stressed how important these pressure vessels were. But he also pointed out that if NASA ultimately were unhappy with the prospect of putting humans on board this rocket, they could replace these with solid metal pressure vessels instead. Dragon 2, uh, which is going to be carrying people, it's quite a light payload and they have quite a large margin. They normally do RTLS and if, if it turns out that they don't have um, if it turns out they need more performance margin, they can always land the booster on the boat if that's, you know, that's their case. One thing that I found really cool was he talked about how they replaced the, the octaweb. That is the main structural component that basically transfers a load of the engines to the rocket. So um, they've changed that. It's now uh, bolted and it's made with a 7000 series of aluminium instead of 2000. No, so 2000 is kind of like the old stuff. That's a copper and aluminium alloy. So the numbers aren't necessarily better or worse. There's no like linear progression. The first digit basically tells you what it's alloyed with. So 2000 series is what a lot of old aviation gear used to be out made of. And it was primarily alloyed with copper. 7000 series primarily alloyed with zinc. And apparently that's the strongest type of aluminium you can generally get. And I remember hearing about this stuff because it's actually what they make iPhones out of. So <laughs> the, uh, the new OctaWeb is stronger, it's all bolted together, it's not welded. There's also apparently more protection around the engines so that if one of the engines goes full on RUD, it will apparently protect the others. And you know, they have evolved these engines a lot. The chamber pressure has been pushed up and up and now they're getting 190,000 pounds of force or uh, 850 kilonewtons or thereabouts. That's basically double what they got with their very first engine, you know, Falcon 9. And there's also one other comment that came out during the uh, launch where the commenter mentioned that the chamber pressure on the Merlin engines during launch gets dropped so that the actual thrust of the rocket stays constant. So as the rocket rises up, the thrust that it actually gets improves slightly because the air pressure around it drops. So it sounds like they're intentionally going to be throttling the engine down because the chamber pressure essentially corresponds to the amount of fuel and oxidizer you're putting in there. It's a uh, functional equivalent to throttling it. But they, I, I do think it is, it's interesting they went specifically to talk about how the chamber pressure was what was changing. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's going to be obviously interesting to watch this. Oh, we also got to see that the Octograbber was in fact doing its job when the uh, ship came back into port. The Octograbber was sitting there holding on for dear life. Good job. Glad to see you. Also, I got to mention Thursday night, Elon did this kind of live press conference with the Boring Company. And from the sounds of it, what they did was they got a tunneling machine and they figured out how it works and they improved it. And they're using, you know, battery powered train cars to take the uh, stuff out of call, obviously Tesla batteries. But it just seems to be that Elon's got the idea of covering transportation at all levels. So they're currently pitching 150 mile an hour tunnels you know, underneath LA to take you from one point of the city to the other, primarily so that Elon can avoid having to commute down those awful highways. Uh, and then obviously intercity, they're talking about the Hyperloop, which is in theory, you know, you evacuate the tunnel, as in you remove the atmosphere from the tunnel. I mean, obviously there's nobody in the tunnel. You remove the air from the tunnel so you can squirt the train cars down at ridiculous speeds. I'm not sure how far that will go, but it's interesting that he's continuing to push this. So yeah, I guess I have more of Elon being Elon, also now known as a Grimes boyfriend after uh, the Met Gala. Uh, he, yeah, yesterday or this morning, he just tweeted out a, an emoji of a, a snail, which uh, I decided to christen Elon's mollusk. So that's what's been going on, and perhaps that gives us some clues as to where things will actually go. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.